Solarize Milbury Sutton. Um, thank you very much for coming. My name is Elizabeth Kennedy. I am with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. I'm here with my colleague, Betsy McDonald, who will be uh, presenting in a few minutes and helping with slides. But for those of you who are not familiar with the Clean Energy Center, we are a quasi-public state agency tasked with um, growing the clean energy sector here in Massachusetts. So. Betsy and I um, work, ooh, pardon me, work exclusively on the solar uh, PV. When we say PV, we mean photovoltaic or electricity generating technologies. And we had been thinking last year about how could we come up with a program that would really drive adoption of solar PV in Massachusetts. So to set the stage a little bit, we have about, we have a rebate program that currently exists and we have about 700 projects that come through that program every three months. But those projects are geographically dispersed throughout the state. And so we really wanted to come up with a program to see if we if we could increase adoption on a local level. So by doing Solar 101s like we're doing here today and working with a local group of volunteers, could we come up with a program that incorporated bulk purchasing with an installer and provided customers through this program with a very competitive price for the technology relative to what customers in other parts of the state are currently paying. So with that, um, I will go into a little bit about the basics of solar PV technology and then we'll explain the program in a little more detail and then talk about some of the financials. And this is really just an educational session trying to get the word out to individuals about how this technology works. Oh, that's the agenda. <laughs> so, you know, historically, but even today, you have people who are looking at renewable energy for environmental reasons. And um, it, it's not surprising, in Massachusetts, we have one of the highest rates of, of asthma in children in the country. Um, we also have um, a state advisory from the Department of Environmental Protection that basically says any pregnant woman, woman thinking of getting pregnant, or children under the age of 12 should not eat fish caught in any fresh water in the state of Massachusetts. And that's because of mercury contamination. You know, we are downwind from the Rust Belt, and so even though we don't have... Um, that much generation in terms of coal-fired power plants, we see the detrimental environmental effects of that. But with the environmental effects aside, really the reason we are here is because of the economics behind solar. Next slide. So this slide, it's a little hard to see, but what we wanted to show is the cost of electricity that you would be paying if you installed solar versus what you would be paying to the utility. So if you look at the slides, the, the blue line represents what you're paying on a per kilowatt hour basis to the utility. This is just a hypo hypothetical, but I assume that the average customer in Massachusetts is paying about 15 cents per kilowatt hour of electricity if you look on your bill. And I'm assuming that that price is going to increase over the next 20 years. And the slope of that line could vary. It may not be as steep, um, or it may be even steeper, but what we do know is that utility upgrades are needed over the next couple of years to keep the grid, uh, grid maintained and going. So most analysts anticipate that our, elect our electricity prices are going to increase. So what the red line represents at the top is the price of electricity generated from solar, assuming that there were no incentives available at all. So clearly it's more expensive currently, but the green line represents the price of electricity from a system when you can take advantage of all of the incentives that are available in Massachusetts. And I'll talk through some of those, but what you're seeing is your savings from owning a solar project is the difference between that green line and that blue line. And the system can last minimum 20 years, generally significantly longer. 
In terms of setting the stage here in Massachusetts, um, in our state we spend about $22 billion a year on energy, and of that, $18 billion leaves the state, and majority of that even leaves the country. So if we could find a way to harness um, some of that uh, some of the money spent on energy and create clean energy and local jobs, um, that's a win for us. So through programs like this and through job development, we are really trying to push clean energy here in the state. This is sort of a hokey slide, <laughs> but um, when we talk about renewable energy or alternative energy, it's really, the, the reason we have this slide in here is just to show that our energy usage um, has evolved over time. You know, it used to be whale oil and then it was coal. Um, so when we, you know, when we think about alternative energy, we're really referring to solar, wind, um, you know, potentially biomass and hydroelectric power. Um, obviously the focus of this is going to be on solar, but um, we do think that sort of evolving to that next phase of technology is important. One of the first questions I always get, um, and Betsy probably gets it even more than me, is do we have enough sun here in Massachusetts to make these projects viable? And the answer is yes. So this map shows the amount of solar energy that reaches the United States. And it's sort of a sliding scale, so if you're in sort of the purple or blues, you have sort of, you know, somewhat poor uh, solar energy, and obviously you know, reds and orange, you have great. Well, Massachusetts is sort of in the middle. And if you look at the box on the bottom right-hand corner of the map, that's the country of Germany. And they have the largest solar market in the world, and they have a worse solar resource than any, of the, any part of the United States. So, to, you know, so long story short, there is enough sun here in Massachusetts. And because we have such high electricity prices, we are the sixth highest in the country. The electricity that you're offsetting to the utility um, is a lot. It, there, there's a significant value to that. So those two, those two reasons can make these projects um, financially viable. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Betsy McDonald. She's going to go over some of the basics of solar PV, and then I'll be back up to talk through the program and some of the financials. So thank you. I'm Betsy, I work at the Clean Energy Center with Elizabeth. I'm gonna steal the show for just a couple of slides and then I'll turn it back over to her to go into some of the financials. But right now we're really just gonna do high level overview, some basic terminology, how the technology works, um, uh, just for a brief introduction, so. Great. So how does solar PV work? Um, the image on the right here is actually taken from a textbook provided by the Department of Energy to teach children how solar works, which is a little bit frightening um, in looking at it because if, if that's how the Department of Energy is explaining it to children, it's no wonder there's confusion or maybe hesitancy about really digging into the technology, but um, it's not that bad, I promise. <laughs> um, so at a high level, solar PV converts sunlight into electricity. So absorbed sunlight dislodges electrons which start to flow and create an electric current. Um, some basic terminology, uh, we talk about system size for, P and T for PV in terms of kilowatts. So 1,000 watts equals one kilowatt. Um, and electricity is measured in kilowatt hours. So the example up there is a 100 watt light bulb running for 10 hours um, is 1,000 watt hours or one kilowatt hour of production. And just for some perspective, an average residential home uses about 8,000 kilowatt hours per year. How does solar PV work on my house? So this is a pretty good diagram. Um, when we were talking about, or when they had the solar cell up on the slide before, solar cells are stringed together to form modules or panels. And the panels form a solar array, which is what you see on the roof up here. Um, the utility and your household appliances use alternating current power, but the, the power produced from a solar PV system is in DC. so. Um, in order to use this electricity, you need to convert the DC power to AC power using an inverter. And that's the box that's highlighted up there. Um, so the power will be converted to AC and it'll run to charge all of your appliances. You'll see there's a meter there. Um, 
I'll get to in the next slide what net metering is, but essentially for most of these systems, uh, you'll be able to net meter uh, your project, which will allow you to uh, sell back to the utility the excess generation. Um, one thing I do want to mention at the bottom here, clear up a common misconception, is that many people think that uh, solar power is going to power them through a storm. You know, there's a big snowstorm, you lose your power, the grid shuts down. They think the solar PV system is going to keep running, and that's not true um, in most cases, so we just want to clear up that misconception right now. The system and inverters are designed to shut down the system when the grid loses power, and it's mostly for utility safety concerns. So, Okay, what is net metering? Uh, net metering is one of the biggest incentives that we have here in Massachusetts, and it's a regulation um, that allows you to, allows the, the utility comes out, installs a meter, and it'll allow your meter to spin forward and backward based on your production and your consumption. So when you're using more power than you're using, your, your, your meter will spin forward. If you're, um, I said that wrong, if you're producing more than you're using, um, and then when you're using more than you're producing, the meter will spin forward and backwards. Um, and the excess credits that you generate are carried over monthly with the utility. Uh, you will receive credits at full retail rate. Whoops, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, do your, does your existing meter right now do that? And the answer is no. The utility would come out and install a special net meter, which would allow it to spin forward and backward based on your production. Um, and you'd receive credits at almost full retail rate. Um, ironically, one thing that you will continue to pay is the renewable energy charge. So, so you will still pay a small amount for renewable energy generation, which you'll see currently on your electric bill if you look at it. It's very small, but... Um, Another common question we get is, how big of a PV system do I need? Um, one of the first, if you start to consider solar, one of the first things that your installer is going to ask you for is a copy of your electric bill. Um, and usually there's a sum summary of your previous year's consumption, and they're going to look at that to determine how big to size your system. The current incentive structure in Massachusetts is really to, to encourage homeowners to size systems to about what they need. We really don't want people to oversize systems or undersize them, so, so typically incentives uh, or, or the size of the system would be about or a little less than what you need uh, to cover your full house. Um, and one thing we're going to mention up here is that efficiency or lower energy use would allow for a smaller system. So if you cut back your total electric need, you're not going to need to spend as much up front because the system you're going to need is going to be smaller. Um, and then the number at the bottom, one kilowatt of PV equals approximately 1,200 kilowatt hours per year. So if you go back to that number we had, the res average residential home in Massachusetts uses about 8,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, and one kilowatt of PV is approximately 1,200 kilowatt hours. So an average residential system size would be about six, six kilowatts, five or six kilowatts. What makes a good site? Um, First and foremost, uh, you should have good southern exposure. You want to have at least four to six hours of direct sunlight every day. Um, an open roof area of about 100 square feet per one kilowatt of capacity. Um, and you also, if you have a big yard, if you have a lot of trees around your house and solar PV on your roof isn't feasible, but you have open space in your yard, there are potential for ground-mounted systems. They typically are a little bit more expensive than roof-mounted systems, but it is definitely an option, um, ground or pole-mounted systems, if you don't have a feasible roof space. Okay. Shading of PV systems. Um, as I mentioned before, having good southern exposure with not a lot of shading is really important to the production of a system. Even a little amount of shading can have a drastic effect on the production of your system. And if your system isn't producing optimally, your payback is going to be a lot longer on these systems. So we really, we really incentivize people to cite these appropriately. Um, and the first, another thing that your installer would do is they'd probably do an initial aerial site assessment with Google Earth or another tool like that to sit at their computer, talk with you, see if you have good southern exposure. Um, then they're going to come out, if, you, if they think you have a good site, uh, they're going to come out and use one of these tools, a solar sun eye or a solar pathfinder, um, and they're going to see exactly what type of production you're going to get. 
Um, and really, the installer is the expert in shading so, and site feasibility. For, in, for purposes of the rebate program, we have a requirement that your system needs to produce 80% of what an optimally sited system would produce. Um, so in purpose, for purposes of getting a rebate, you have to have a pretty good site, and it is a strict standard. We want you to get a good payback on your system, and we want it to perform as we would hope it to. So, so that's one of the reasons for that requirement. Um, what to do with a non-feasible site? I think the number from the pilot program that we ran last year was about, of, of all the people that were interested in going solar, only about 30 to 35% actually had a feasible site for solar. So we really want to talk about other options. If you're excited about PV, you want to go renewable, you want to do something, um, but your, your site just isn't feasible. Um, so we always want to stress energy efficiency first. It's the low-hanging fruit. It's going to be the most cost effective, and as we mentioned before, it would decrease uh, your overall electric needs. So efficiency first, mass save offers free energy audits. Um, and there are other renewable technologies. We have a rebate program for solar hot water. Um, we're looking into programs for geothermal and biomass. Um, a neat idea that happened out of the program last year was community solar project. Um, it's really not applicable probably to the, the lifespan of this individual program, this solarized mass pilot. But last year, people who didn't have feasible sites decided to band together um, to put a big system off-site somewhere, and each, they'd each sort of buy a portion of the big system. Again, it's not, it probably won't happen. It's very legally complicated. Um, so it probably wouldn't happen in the time span of this program, but something to consider. And finally, just help us spread the word about solarized mass. Uh, the group in Millbury Sutton is doing a great job already, lots of volunteers, um, so just spread the word. Great, thank you very much. We're gonna switch gears a little bit and I'll, I'll dive into some more details about the actual program. Um, and then talk about some of the financials. So solarized mass, what, what we were aiming to do in this program is really reduce the complexity of um, installing solar. So you, you know, as a homeowner or a business owner, you know, have to know what all of the incentives are that are available. You, you need to go out and, you know, potentially vet numerous installers and try and get different quotes. And so what we really wanted to do was, one, help to reduce those hurdles. So by one, providing some education on the technology, um, that in and of itself would help. But what we also wanted to do was see if we could reduce the costs of the technology as well. So um, the Clean Energy Center is working with the towns of Millbury and Sutton, and we have actually gone out to bid and had installers bid very competitive pricing for residential projects under this program. And so we have gone through a fairly complex vetting process and have actually selected second generation to be the installer under this program. And it's an installer that has done numerous installations through our various rebate program and has provided tremendously competitive pricing relative to the average um, system cost, which I'll, I'll show you graphically in a minute. We also, um, I'll go into this in more detail, but we wanted to have, we wanted it to be sort of a limited time offer because this is such competitive pricing. So the program will run basically from today until September 30th. And the idea is that as more people sign up, the cheaper the price will be for everyone. So the Clean Energy Center, we're partnering with 17 communities this summer. Um, Sutton and Millbury are two of them. As I mentioned, we've selected second generation energy as the installer and they have provided competitive tiered pricing. So what do I mean by that when I say when more people sign up? As, as people sign contracts with the installer this summer, so you, you express your interest in at least seeing if you have a feasible site. And as Betsy mentioned, second generation will go online, see if, you know, from an aerial photo, do you have what they think will be a feasible site. If you do, then they will go out to your site and actually do that shading analysis and be able to provide you with an estimate of how much, they, how much electricity they think a system would produce, and that will help you determine the financials. And then at that point, if you still want to move forward, you would sign a contract. So as more people sign contracts, 
that sort of total aggregate capacity will determine what tier we are in the program. So between now and September 30th, as more people sign up, we'll move from tier one to tier two, hopefully all the way up to tier five, which is the cheapest price. So if you're the first person to sign up today, if you were to contract today, the final price is determined by September 30th. What we found under the pilot program last year, we did it in four communities last year, and what we found was the initial price on average offered by the installers that we were working with was immediately 8% less than what the average was that we see in our current rebate program. But as you went into the higher tiers, you could save up to 33% off of the, off of the average price. So the model really does work by sort of this group purchasing model and encouraging other people to sign up. So this slide, we, we try to delineate sort of the role of the different parties in the program. So we as a Clean Energy Center, we're helping with education, we're helping to provide some marketing and outreach assistance to the communities just to help spread the word. And then we are also providing rebates to every customer um, through this program. The community is really sort of in charge of the, you know, on the ground, grassroots marketing and outreach. So working with volunteers, anyone who's interested in, in helping to spread the word, um, they, you know, organizing events like this. The installer sort of has the, the bulk of the responsibility. So second generation energy will, one, determine if your site is feasible. If it is and you decide to move forward, they would contract with you and then they'll be responsible with, for all of the permitting, for the application to the rebate program, for dealing with the utility and handling interconnection of the system. So they're, they're there to provide you with a turnkey service. And I do want to mention that um, Second Generation is offering two ownership models. So if you have the capital and you want to pay for the system outright and own the system, they have that option. If you don't have the, the, the money or you wanted to use the money towards something else, you have the option of entering into sort of a third party agreement where a, a company will own the system and sell you the power and with the idea being that you're paying less for the electricity generated by the solar system than you would be paying to the utility. So from day one, with little to no money down, you can still be saving money. This, this slide, where we wanted to show some of the results from the pilot program that we did last summer. And this slide, it, it looks complex, but what it's trying to show is the savings that customers received under the program. So when we talk about costs of solar, solar PV projects, we talk about it on a dollar per watt basis. So that blue line represents the average installed cost of residential scale projects last summer through our rebate program. And what the green bars represent is the tiered pricing that was offered by the installers in each of those communities. So if you look at the town of Harvard, for, for instance, in the middle, the first tier, which is at $5.50 a watt, was already cheaper than what the average customer in our rebate program was getting. And as they reached higher tiers, it continued to drop. That red dot represents where each of the communities got to at the end of the program. So in the town of Harvard, they did actually reach their highest tier, which, which meant that the price dropped all the way down to $4 a watt. So that's significant savings relative to most of the customers that are coming through our rebate program. I put this slide up here because I wanted to show that the model really does work. So in the four pilot communities last summer, and, and just so you, if you can't see it, they, they were Hatfield, Harvard, Winchester, and Situate. Each of those communities had a handful of residential projects installed when the program began. And this was, you know, total systems that had ever been installed um, up until that point. And so if you look at Harvard, for example, they had about 12 or 13 projects in the community. Under the four-month contracting period, the sign-up period of the program last summer, they had 75 people sign contracts for solar. 
an exponential increase in the number of projects because it was a really good deal. It made sense for them to do that. So all of the communities, we saw a five-fold increase in the number of projects. So it, the model does work. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the financials. So in, in terms of the financials, they're really, um, they're really influenced by the various um, incentives that are available, whether they're through the Clean Energy Center or through state regulations. And so one of the reasons that solar is viable in Massachusetts is because of communities like your own that are green communities and the state legislature that have really tried to drive clean energy here in Massachusetts. This slide shows sort of a history of residential solar in the state, and it shows two things. The blue line represents the average installed cost of solar going back to 2002. So in 2002, it used to cost $12 a watt to install solar. And as you can see, the price has dropped dramatically. When I started in 2007, residential projects had a payback of anywhere from 12 to 15 years. And now, with an average installation cost of a little over $5 a watt, we're seeing projects on average with paybacks around, you know, six to seven years. So prices have dropped dramatically, and that's mainly because of sort of global market forces. But what we have seen, too, is obviously, as prices come down, the number of installations go up. So the green bars represent the number of residential projects that have gotten installed in the state. So they have been increasing as well. I won't spend too much time on this. Um, you'll hear people refer to power purchase agreements or lease options, and that's, those are sort of alternate options to owning the system. So when I mentioned working with a third party, a third party could potentially own the system and sell you the power at a discounted rate, even though it's on your roof, or they could potentially lease the system to you and you could pay uh, a monthly lease payment. So second generation will offer one of those two options. So if you don't want to pay, uh, pay the upfront cost to own the system, there will still be an option to save money and install solar. This slide sort of summarizes the different incentives in Massachusetts, and we sort of refer to it as a stack of incentives. And these incentives adjust as the, markets, uh, the market in Massachusetts adjusts. So currently in, uh, in Massachusetts, well, if you're installing solar, one of the main incentives are tax credits. So there is a 30% federal tax credit on the installed cost of the system. And, and it's not a deduction, it's an actual credit um, calculated on the full cost of the system that you would get you know, the following year when you, fought, when you filed your taxes. There's also a $1,000 Massachusetts income tax credit. There are rebates through the Clean Energy Center, which I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. And then there's net metering, which Betsy mentioned earlier. And um, just to sort of re refresh your memory, the idea behind net metering is when you're producing more electricity than you're using at any given point in time, you feed that electricity back into the utility, and you can sort of use them as a bank. So they build up this credit for you. And then when you, let's say you get home at night, your system's not producing anything anymore, but you start turning on your appliances, your lights, you eat into that credit before the utility starts charging you for your electricity usage. So that's the benefit of net metering. And then there's um, an incentive called SREX, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And then this idea of working with a third party to do a lease or a power purchase agreement um, and not having to put any money or, you know, few few dollars down um, to own, I mean, to receive the benefits of a solar project. In terms of the rebates, 
uh, the Clean Energy Center currently has a rebate program. It's called the Commonwealth Solar 2 Rebate Program. And what we have decided is that any customer coming through this program will be eligible to receive a rebate equivalent to those available under our, our current rebate program. So the way the rebates work is systems up to 15 kilowatts in size are eligible to receive a rebate, but the rebate's calculated on the first five kilowatts. And it's, it's a dollar per watt basis. So the way it works is you would receive, if you look at the chart, you'd receive 40 cents per watt. That's the base incentive. So if it was a five kilowatt system, you'd get a $2,000 rebate. And then there are adders. So there's an adder if some of the equipment that's used is manufactured in Massachusetts. And there are two adders that you could potentially qualify for. It, it's, an, it's an either or. You, you can't qualify for both, but there's a moderate home value adder and a moderate income adder, which the next slide I'll go into more detail on that. But our average rebate is about $2,000. It generally represents about 7% of the installed cost. And, and as I mentioned, the, the incentive levels under this program will be equivalent under, to what is available under our current rebate program. With the adders, the moderate home value adder is calculated on the total assessed value of your property. So it's building and land, and it's on a per county basis. And the moderate income adder is determined by the gross household income. So if you live alone, there's an individual threshold, or if you have other people living in your house, there's a domestic unit threshold. And to provide some assurance to, to just to, to this program and to the systems, um, the Clean Energy Center has minimum requirements that these systems need to meet and that the installer needs to meet in order to provide you with, with a quality system. So we have, one, um, we only let installers into the program that had done numerous uh, numerous projects through our rebate program and who we felt confident understood how to navigate you know, the permitting process and install quality installations. We also had minimum technical requirements in terms of warranties. So at minimum, uh, the installer needed to provide a five-year workmanship warranty on the system and the equipment had to had to meet certain thresholds. So the panels needed to have a 20-year production warranty, and the inverter, which converts the generation, the, the power from DC to AC, that inverter, that piece of equipment, needed to have a minimum 10-year warranty. And in terms of sort of while I'm on warranties, in terms of moving parts for the, these projects, there are very few moving parts. You know, once you've installed the system, you don't really need to do um, much maintenance to the system. But one thing to keep in mind is the inverter warranty is 10 years. They generally last 12 to 15 years, but at some point the inverter will fail and you'll have to replace that piece of equipment. So these are projects that, you know, at minimum last 20 years, but could potentially last 30 plus years. And so at some point over the life of the system, uh, you will have to replace the inverter. But uh, just to put it in context, the city of Beverly has a solar installation at their high school that was installed in the 70s and the system is still producing more than 80 percent of what it was producing the first day it was installed. So these things do last a long time. The question was how expensive is it to replace an inverter? Currently you could anticipate for a residential project $2,000 um, roughly, uh, give, give or take. 10 or 15 years from now, it could be significantly less expensive. So, um, as Betsy mentioned, we also have sort of minimum production requirements. So we want these systems to be sited well so that they produce enough electricity to provide you with a good payback. In terms of insurance, 
we have not been prescriptive as to the levels of insurance that the installer, second generation, will need to have in terms of working on your home if you decide to contract with them. And we did that intentionally because we don't know what, what you think would be the appropriate level. So just keep in mind, if you do contract and decide to move forward with a solar project, um, it would be like working with a general contractor. So um, sit down with them and make sure that you're comfortable with the insurance requirements that, I mean, with the insurance levels that they currently have. And then finally, in terms of taxes, if you um, own the system and you do receive a rebate under our program, I just wanted to let everyone know that you will receive a 1099. Um, we are legally not allowed to give any tax advice, so our recommendation is just to talk with a tax advisor about that. All right, I, mes I mentioned SREX earlier, and this, is this slide right here will probably be the most complex slide you'll see in this whole presentation. Um, and I'm going to punt any of the really complex questions to Mike Judge, who works for the Department of Energy Resources, since they, they created this program. But the, the SREC program, it, it's really a production incentive in prog program. So the way it works is when you install solar on your home, you're really producing two value streams. You're producing the electricity that feeds into your home that you could net meter and you're, you know, you're directly offsetting your usage. But then you're also producing the green attribute associated with installing solar. So it's what, it's what distinguishes the electrons from your solar system from electrons that are generated from a coal-fired power plant. And so it, it's, how, it's a certificate that helps you distinguish that. And there is a market in the state of Massachusetts that that the state set up to sell these SRECs. The utilities are obligated to buy a certain number of SRECs every year. So you as a homeowner can work with an aggregator or a broker and they will help you sell these SRECs and you can receive income from that. So one SREC is equivalent to 1,000 kilowatt hours of generation. So when you turn your system on, you start creating electricity. And when you get to 1,000 kilowatt hours, you've created one SREC. And just to, to think about it in terms of an average residential system, a five kilowatt system, if sited well, will produce about five to six SRECs per year. And the SREC market is set up, so there's sort of, there's a ceiling and, and a floor. And the way it works is that um, the, the ceiling is currently $550 per SREC. And, and the floor, I say a floor, it's not really a floor, it's an auction, but the, the floor is $285. And your S, the, a broker or an aggregator will help you sell your SRECs within that sort of market window. Next slide. The bottom line, though, is that you as a homeowner don't need to worry about selling them directly. There are businesses out there that help you do that. Um, you, if you install solar, you'll report monthly production to the Clean Energy Center um, because we help to review the production and help you actually mint those SRECs to sell. But if you install a system... If you install a system in 2012, you'll be eligible to sell SRECs for the next 10 years. So that's an income from selling those SRECs for 10 years. That's it. I, I put this slide up. I, I'm, I'm going to dive into a bit of a financial analysis. And I put this slide up because I wanted to show the assumptions that went into my calculations. And I do this, one, so there's a little bit of transparency, but two, so you can see the numbers because they're tremendously conservative. I would rather sort of um, undersell the system and have them overperform for you. So um, I'll go through these, these assumptions, but... In, in previous meetings, I've had people who have installed solar stand up and say, yeah, your assumptions really are conservative because <laughs> we're seeing significantly better numbers than that. But what I'm doing is I'm assuming that you're installing the average size system of five kilowatts and that um, the output of your system, the, the panel production, will decrease by 1% every year because that's what they're, they're warranted to not reduce any more than that. That's a very conservative assumption. Most people will say that that will not happen. But um, that the production decreases by 1% every year. 
and that you're paying 15 cents per kilowatt hour to the utility currently, and that that price is going to increase by 3% every year over the next 20 years. Oh, I'm being told I need to speak louder. <laughs> So, um, and, and a 3% th increase on your electricity production, excuse me, your electricity price is not, um, is not unheard of. We've seen, on average, prices increase to the utility by more than that. I'm assuming the system's going to last 20 years, though we, we know that it will likely last much longer than that. And that you're selling your SREX for sort of the minimum, the $285 per SREC for the next 10 years. And because we consider, or the, the IRS um, considers selling SRECs um, income, I'm assuming that you're going to get taxed on that income at 28%. And then I just used a discount rate of 7.5% in the model. There are a lot of numbers up here, and I know it's probably hard to, hard to see, so I, I don't want to panic anyone. But what I did is I just sort of walked through the financials of the average cost system and then the Tier 5 pricing um, for a system under this program with second generation, second generation energy. And so if you, I'll walk through the average column first. So the average price is $5.23 per watt. And I've, because we're doing a five kilowatt system, the cost is a little over $26,000. But then you get sort of the minimum rebate through our program of $2,000. So that comes off the top right there. So your total after the rebate is a little over $24,000. And then the next year when you file your taxes, you get a 30% federal tax credit, which is, what, 77 or 72? A little over $7,000. And then you get the $1,000 Massachusetts income tax credit. So then your total after tax credits is about $16,000. But then, so now you've gotten all of the upfront incentives, but now you have... 20 years of saving electricity payments to the utility because you don't have to pay them as much. And then you also have 10 years of being able to sell your SRECs. So I said, well, what is the val what, what's the value stream of those two incentives to me today? And when you take all of those into consideration, you're really positive about $1,900 and the system has a payback of seven to eight years. And if you keep all of those conservative assumptions in place and you just squish down the installed cost, which is what we're doing under this program, and so now rather than having it be $5.23, the towns of Sutton and Millbury get to the highest tier and they're actually getting systems installed at $3.90. All of a sudden, you're positive over $7,000 with roughly a five-year payback. So by driving down the costs, we're seeing the economics change significantly. This is the same slide that I showed early on. Um, I just incorporated a, a potential power purchase agreement into it just to sort of visually show how these systems work. So the blue line, just to reiterate, the blue line represents what you're paying to the utility for your electricity, hypothetically over the next 20 years. The green line at the bottom represents, if you owned the system, what you would be paying for the electricity that that system produced. So, you know, you're starting out at 15 cents to the utility today, but you could be paying 8 cents for the electricity uh, if you owned the system. And then I inserted a purple line there and said, okay, well, maybe you don't want, you don't, you don't have $20,000 to put down on a system, but you still want to consider solar, you could enter into a power purchase agreement, and then maybe, this is just a hypothetical, but maybe you're paying 11 cents instead of 15 cents. So that price will likely increase, but your savings is the difference between the blue line and the purple line. So there are still ways to save money, um, even if you don't want to own the system. All right, getting started. 
it's really hard to see, I apologize. But this slide shows all of the 17 communities, and this is just sort of a starting line. So to give everyone a sense of, of where we are at the beginning of the program. So Sutton Millbury, you're the second in from the right. And what this chart shows is the, the blue bar is the number of residential, system, residential scale systems that you currently have installed between the two communities. And the red dot represents um, what that is as a percentage of the combined population of the two towns. So um, sort of in the, in the middle of the pack, with the exception of, you know, Boston, it's, it's a huge city, they have, they have a lot of projects. But um, this is sort of a starting point and we'll be comparing before and after the program. Um, next steps, it's really, if it's something that you're interested in, we recommend signing up. Second generation is actually, they have a table right here. We recommend signing up to see if you have a feasible site. It's non-binding at this point. We really just want to spread the word about the program. Um, you have a great team of volunteers in the communities who can help answer some of your questions. And Betsy and Mike Judge and I will be here for a little while to help answer some as well. But we recommend going to the website, solarizemass.com, um, signing up for site assessment. We also just encourage everyone, again, to reiterate energy efficiency is really the first thing that you should be looking at. Um, if you get a rebate under our program, um, one of the requirements will be to get an energy audit, so it doesn't hurt to contact MassSave at this point and at least start scheduling one. And then finally, yeah, just... Tell your friends, and that's it. Thank you.